Well, this morning, as we come and celebrate 40 years as a church, it's an awesome thing to be able to do that. It's an awesome thing to think of how God has worked in ages past and about how His glory continues to shine. And so today for a text, I've chosen Psalm 92, and we're going to look at the first five verses of Psalm 92 in, in just a few moments. And uh, I want us to think about this in a sense of being responsibly thankful. Responsibly thankful. Responsibility is a word that brings to mind ideas of what? Being an adult? Being a parent? Being a team leader? taking hold of the things given to a person to, to do and making sure that they're followed through on. There's a lot of different ideas that come with the idea of responsibility. And in 1621, the, uh, the Plymouth colonists and the Wampanoag uh, Indians, they, they shared an autumn harvest feast that's acknowledged today as one of the first Thanksgiving celebrations in the colonies. And for more than two centuries... Days of Thanksgiving were celebrated by individual colonies and in individual states. <clears throat> but it's during the Civil War in 1863 that then President Abraham Lincoln proclaimed a national day of Thanksgiving to be held every November. And this morning, as we come to the text of Scripture, what we have before us, you know, is, uh, is a hymn of gratitude. This writer goes well beyond theology to express his deep thankfulness to God who had become so intensely real to him. As a matter of fact, we've just completed a study in his life, the life of David, the man of God. And we discovered how David uh, was a young man when God had identified him and pulled him out to be a great man, uh, a great warrior, as well as a great king among his people. But it began in David's life as a young shepherd boy overlooking the sheep of his father in those fields at night. When he could write the words of Psalm 23 and declare, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And about how he guided him in the, to the green pastures and beside the still waters. How he was protected by the rod and by the staff how God walked with him all the way through. And so by the time you get to this place in which he, he pens this psalm of, of thanksgiving, you know, he expresses a deep thankfulness to this God to whom he is intimately close. As a matter of fact, in the very first five verses of Psalm 92, we learn that for a true child of God, there, can, there are principles of thankfulness. And the scripture reads it like this. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands I sing for joy. How great are your works, O Lord! Your thoughts are very deep. And I've thought about that, and I've tried to make application to that as I've thought about who Village is. You know, who is Village Church? Who is this Great Commission Baptist Church? Who are we? Well, we're a group of people that live here on a year-round basis, but we're also a group of people that are here intermittently. Some get to come for a few weeks at a time. Some come and spend the fall or winter or summer, whatever it may be. But we're, you know, we're a, a mixed group of people. And today at Village, we come to celebrate 40 years. 40 years of God's provision. 40 years of God's blessing and His guidance and His gifts and His presence upon us, His people. And I was thinking about our founding parents. You know, who are those people, those who took responsibility on and 
follow the leadership of God so as to come out and to form a new church. Our founding parents believed in and trusted in the Lord God Almighty for His hand. And through this day, we exhibit that very same trust. I've heard the stories told about when they purchased the land from Mr. Henderson, about being so far out of town, talking of carpooling to get out here. I've seen the pictures. Uh, you may want to stop at the table out in the uh, hallway. There's historical scrapbooks. I mean, there's some cool stuff in there. Really cool stuff. Frankie Hensley's in there as a student. It, 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 Frankie, it is amazing how many times your picture's in the books. But, but she hasn't changed a bit. Did that get me a cookie? <laughs> and, and so many other people. And God has been so good. His blessings have been so real. And I look and, and I see all these people that have been a part. And it was back in 1975, this band began to pray together. In 1976, they actually formed the church. And they began meeting in a home and then in the Destin Elementary School. And they raised the money to purchase these three acres of our camp, the first three acres of our campus. And they built buildings under the direction of Al Christopher. And, and they labored many times at night. And they built those first two little buildings down there. I remember the first time I walked into the worship building and I felt like I was preaching to the world, all 60 of us. I walk in there today and I wonder, how did we ever do it? How did that ever work out? But you know, God has been so good. He has blessed us in so many ways. And that small group of people continue to move forward in their faith in God. And through the years, this church has continued to move forward through its faith in God under the direction of God's Holy Spirit. More land was bought and, and more buildings were built. And, and today, untold thousands of people come through our doors every year. And God's doing things. And I'm grateful for that. And that's what the psalmist is talking about. He's talking about living with an attitude of thanksgiving. I'm excited to see what the next 40 years bring. I'm excited to see what God will do next week. And because of, of, of God's blessing in our lives, the very first thing we've got to recognize is we must be thankful. We must be thankful. You know, when you, when you uh, give a, a, a child a gift, you expect that child to say what? Thank you. As a matter of fact, I, I heard uh, some commentator saying that manners are missing in America, and if we could teach children to be grateful again and thankful again and have manners again, it might change our society a little bit. But you know, as, our ch as we do, our, our children do. And we've got to be a, a thankful people. In Psalm 92, 1, it says, It is good to give thanks to the Lord. It's good to sing praises to your name, O Most High. And so there's a serious implication in that statement. If it's good to give thanks to the Lord, it must be bad to, hold, to, to not give thanks. As a matter of fact, you know, one of the, in, in the stages of descent from godliness... You know what Paul lists as a major indicator of a godless individual? Thanklessness. As a matter of fact, he writes to the Romans in Romans 121. He says, For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. They became futile in their thinking. They didn't honor God. They didn't look to God and say, God, thank you. Thank you for this beautiful day. They didn't look to God and, and say, thank you for this food that's on my table. They didn't look to God and say, thank you for your provision and for your blessing and for your patience towards me. Lord, thank you that you didn't give me what I deserve. Thank you that you gave me what I couldn't earn. And, and the reason I must be thankful is it is good for me. 
The Bible says it is good to give thanks to the Lord. That goodness comes to me as I give thanks to Him. But you know, the question that then comes is how am I to be thankful and for what reason? You know, why are you thankful today? Think about it. Why are you thankful? What's God done in your life? Maybe you're broken this morning and you're, you're thinking, well, I don't know if God's done anything. He's held your hand this far. He's taking you through whatever valley you may be in. Why are you thankful? Maybe God has healed you. Why are you thankful? Maybe God delivered you from something. Why are you thankful? You've seen God's hand of mercy and, 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 and the blessings of heaven poured out in your life. And, and we have to be bless, uh, thankful for the blessings of our past. Verse 4 says, For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the work of your hands I sing for joy. And so this psalmist begins looking back and, and remembering how God had blessed him and had made his heart glad. And when we look behind and begin to remember, you know, we find the hand of God not only leading us, but we find that same hand of God providing for us and protecting us and restoring us and picking up behind us in our lives in every respect. You know, the past, think about the past spiritual blessings. For Lord, you have made me glad by your work. You know, if you think for a moment, that work in our lives, it was not a work that I had done. You know, there's, there's nothing good in me to commend me to God. By the work of His hand, I am righteous and I'm adopted into His family. And God becomes my Father. And Jesus becomes my Savior. And the Holy Spirit becomes my Comforter. And the Bible becomes my guide. And the church becomes my home. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesians, and said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with some spiritual blessings. No. What does it say? Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. There's nothing left out. You know, God didn't hold anything back in your life. He gave you every spiritual blessing and then some. Isn't that an awesome thing? He holds nothing back. He didn't give you some, but He gave you every and then some. He has blessed you immensely. And when I remember, I come to realize the impossibility of even beginning to count the many blessings that God has brought about in my life. The old song says, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. And God has blessed you. Look at your family that's sitting beside you. Look at your friends. Look at those warm bodies around, and you begin to realize just how blessed we are. And then our past social blessings. The psalmist said, you've made me glad by your work. Psalm 68, 6 says, God settles the solitary in a home. He leads out the prisoners to prosperity. But the rebellious dwell in a parched land. You know, some people are living in a parched land today. They're not living in relation with other people. You know, part of who we are as a church is we're a people that love God. A second part of who we are, we're a people that say we're being real. We're living in relationship with one another. We don't have to live solitary lives. And we bring hope to the prisoner. So love God, be real, bring hope. But, but when you think about this, he, he says, you know, he settles the solitary in a home. You know, that's exactly what happened to you when Jesus Christ became your Savior. He put you in a church. Now, you may not have been saved here at Village. You know, you may have moved a membership here from Timbuktu. And chances are one day you'll go back to a Timbuktu kind of place. Right? But wherever you are in whatever church family God has allowed you to be planted, He has given you a home. 
He's given you a home. You know, I think of the home that we celebrate as a church. Our relationships. Our friendships. You know, our, our friendships and relationships, that they go deep. You know what? You know, I, I had some friends that have gone on to heaven, but back in the 90s when they were still alive, every, every winter when they would come down from Murfreesboro, Tennessee, they brought me a whole salt-cured ham. And, uh, and I remember meeting that very first fall. There was a man that, that, came through, that came down every year, Wayne Ferguson and um, Selma. And every year, right at Thanksgiving, they'd get here, and you know what he brought? Because they had a Christmas tree farm in North Carolina. Can you guess? A Christmas tree. And, and then Betty Anderson bakes me a pound cake for my birthday. And most recently, Susan Bales discovered I like sausage balls. <laughs> you can tell I like to eat. And we're a family. When I first moved here, I bought this little house that needed a lot of fixing up, and there's a guy by the name of Gary O'Konzak. Gary came over and said, Preacher, I'll do anything to help you, but just don't ask me to get up on a ladder. And I forgot all about the ladder part, and the first thing I asked him to do was climb a ladder. <laughs> and you know, he did it. He did it. And I look back and I think of those people that have interacted in this place and God has given us home. And all of you have got stories like that. You remember the Bob and Dee Dee Harveys and the, the, the Lauren Browns in Geneva. And you remember all these people through the years. I remember in that old building, you know, those nights of worship that we'd come together and how God would move in us and how God would move through people. And God has given us a home. It's a great church and God's still adding to it. And, and so we've got those solitary blessings. You know, Louis Armstrong wrote that song in which he said, What a wonderful world. He said, I see trees of green and roses too. I see them bloom for me and you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. As I was driving in this morning, I looked out across the water as the wind was blowing out of the north and the sun was shining bright. And I was thinking, Lord, you've given us so much to be thankful for. But even the beauty out there and the beauty of a, of a super moon this week, which I couldn't see, I was in... Clearwater Beach, and it was cloudy. I could not believe it. So I've had to look at everybody else's pictures. It doesn't compare to the beauty of what God has done among us as friends and family. Amen? I mean, that's good stuff. Or at least I thought it was when I was jotting down notes. And, and those past temporal blessings. Lord, you've made me glad by your work. And Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. You know, you think upon God's favor upon our homes and prosperity in our business and the health giving of our food to our bodies, and these are all a part of his divine work. William Law, the, the Puritan writer, considered um, a thankful heart as an essential quality of sainthood. He said, you can't really love the Lord and not be thankful. He said, would you know who is the greatest saint in the world? It is not he who prays the most or fasts the most. It's not he who gives alms or who is most eminent for temperance, chastity, or justice. But it's he who's always thankful to God, who receives everything as an instant of God's goodness and has a heart always ready to praise God for it. And not only do we look at the past, but we anticipate the blessing of God in the future. What God has right in front of us. Verses 4 and 5 of our text declare, For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands I sing for joy. 
How great are your works, O Lord! Your thoughts are very deep. You know, that's a a really a thrilling statement when you think about it. The psalmist looked back and with gladness and with gratitude, he, he thought of God and how God had blessed him and lavished his good favor upon his life. But now the psalmist, with expectation, he, he exalts, he rejoices in what God has for the future. In what God has for the future. He said, how great are your works, O Lord. Your thoughts, literally, your designs and your purposes are very deep. You know, I don't understand everything that happens in life. But God's designs and His purposes are much deeper below the surface than I can even imagine. You know, I tend to see things on the surface. As a matter of fact, if you think about your life as a quilt, you know, you're only seeing one little patch at a time. But what God sees is the masterpiece. He's got a design and and He's got a purpose. Could you begin to imagine what God has for you in your personal life in the future? And begin to dream and and to vision what God has for His church, village in the future. And and ultimately, I know it's a glorious consummation because the Bible says that one day the trump will blow and the skies will be opened up and those who have loved Him are going to be called up to meet Him in the air. You know, no matter how great our past, it doesn't compare to what God has yet for us. And so Paul declared to the Corinthians. He said, What no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, no heart of man has imagined, what God has prepared for those who love Him. You can't even begin to imagine what God has for you. You know, a prayer, when we talk to God, that doesn't give thanks to God for what he's going to do is not a prayer of faith. You see, for faith is more than asking. It's taking from the hand of God and saying, thank you, thank you. So that leads us to something else, second major thought, the task of thankfulness. And if I'm going to be truly thankful, I've got to understand something. It's a major activity. Psalm 92, 1 and 2, It's good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. So it's a major activity, and it involves and it engages every bit of us, spirit, soul, and body. And so there's spiritual thankfulness. You know, there's a level of praying and praising that cannot be expressed in words. It's an activity that happens within the, the realm of the Spirit. Paul said, For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I'll pray with my spirit, but I'll pray with my mind also. I'll sing praise with my spirit, but I'll sing praise with my mind also. And God is seeking those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. To search out and to come to know the deep things of God. It's a level of personal thankfulness to sing praises to your name, O Most High. You know, this praising is not so much with spirit as it is with understanding. You know, it uses both our mental and our, our, our vocal powers. You know, the, the Westminster Catechism says that man's chief end, our, our highest goal, is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. I mean, if you can learn, if you can learn to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever, I mean, you're getting pretty close to arriving as a follower of Jesus Christ. Think about that. Think about the times when you glorified God and loved Him the most in your own personal life your character difference, your spiritual difference, the flame of the fire in your soul difference, as opposed to the times that you've not been that way. 
So our chief end is to glorify God and, and to love Him forever. And there's no greater activity than to sing to the name of the Most High God. Now, some people think, well, that's a choir thing. And you think, well, if I'm going to be in the choir, maybe I've got to try out. You don't have to try out. You know, like I said, we're a family. We're friends. Like, you know, there's a guy in the choir. I don't know how to say that. But John Thomas told me he wasn't that good. So I asked the people that sit around him, and they all agree. (laughs) Love you, brother. But what I'm getting at is you don't have to be pitch perfect. Even my daughter could sing. You don't want to hear her, but she could. Lydia. Elena can rock it wherever she's hiding. Oh. Zoe likes to sing. But what I'm getting at is this. God didn't tell us we had to be in tune. He said, make a what? Okay, y'all learned that in Awana. Make a joyful noise. So let's try that together, Okay. And whatever, whatever phrase you want to make, whether it be a praise the Lord or glory be to God or hallelujah, on the count of three, let's all shout out at the very same time. One, two, three. Glory to God. Now, as we all lifted up that praise, that joyful noise, that's what it came across as, it honored God. And what Matt can help you to do is put music to it. Amen, Matt? I mean, I'm preaching this for you. (laughs) So to to, to, to plug in and, and to love each other like that. You know... But, but even more than the testimony of our lips is the thanksgiving of our lives. It's not only to, to say it, but to mean it. You know, Paul was able to declare, For me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. To Titus, he said, Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age. August uh, Ludwig Storm, who was born in Sweden, as a young man was converted to Christ in a Salvation Army meeting. He soon joined the Salvation Army Corps, and he wrote this hymn text for the Army's publication. Thanks be to God for my Redeemer. Thanks for all that Thou dost provide. Thanks for times now but a memory. Thanks for Jesus by my side. Thanks for pleasant, balmy springtime. Thanks for the dark and dreary fall. Thanks for tears by now forgotten. Thanks for peace within my soul. Thanks for the prayers that thou hast answered. Thanks for what thou dost deny. Reminds me of that country song, Sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. Thanks for the storms I have weathered. Thanks for all thou dost supply. Thanks for the pain and thanks for pleasure. Thanks for comfort in despair. Thanks for roses by the wayside. Thanks for thorns their stems contain. Thanks for home and thanks for fireside. Thanks for hope and the sweet refrain. Thanks for joy and thanks for sorrow. Thanks for heavenly peace with thee. Thanks for hope in thee tomorrow. Thanks for all eternity. And so that leads us to that place of musical thankfulness. He says, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night to the music of the lute and the harp and the melody of the lyre. You know, the harp had ten strings and it was used to worship God, not only in the temple, but in smaller gatherings with the faithful. It was symbolic uh, of the outgoing of the total personality of man in, in, in ministry and praise. And, and the harpists were usually professionals, and, and their time was mostly spent both morning and night strumming their praise to God or leading in worship in the house of God. And what's true of the harpist is to be equally true in our lives today. 
You know, the rise in the sun, each day brings forth opportunities to show forth loving kindness and the mercy of the Lord, along with the setting sun to declare His faithfulness. And our total makeup declares to be a symphony of praise to God. You know, David describes God's deliverance even when life is tough. You know, sometimes you feel overwhelmed. I was thinking about some of our church members that have just been diagnosed with cancer, and others not making blood, and others open heart bypass surgeries, and others issues with their kids. I know your kids, for the most part, never give you an issue, but some people, it happens. Matter of fact, I was telling somebody the other day, they are saying they're not getting much sleep with their newborn. I said, that only lasts about three months. Then you'll get some sleep, and then they turn into be teenagers, and that lasts about ten years. <laughs> but think about this, if you would. Even in the times of greatest stress, we can declare with a psalmist, he put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. And many will see in fear and put their trust in the Lord. As you go through that kind of stage in your life, I mean, that's what God does. Like Paul and Silas in the book of Acts, they found themselves locked up in a, uh, in a jail for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, you know, at the beginning of the day, everything was sunny and beautiful and warm, and, and everybody was kind of kind. And by the end of the day, they're locked up and thrown into the innermost pro- prison, and the jailer's given the command, don't let these men escape or something's going to happen and it's dark and it's cold nobody's providing them blankets they don't have a television they don't have warm food coming in or anything like that and they're in the innermost prison and Paul and Silas began to sing to sing praise to God it's about midnight and there was an earthquake and the doors opened and the doors not only opened for their cells but the doors opened for the prisoners that were locked inside. As a matter of fact, the Scripture says in the book of Acts that those prisoners listened. And that word listen, to break it down in the Greek, it means they heard with pleasure. They heard with pleasure. Oh, how good and pleasant it is to give praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. They listen with pleasure. And so Paul tells us that as the family of God in the book of Ephesians, we are to address one another in psalms and in hymns and in spiritual songs. And on top of that, we are to sing and make melody to the Lord with our heart. And you know what that means? It means that we come together and we worship the Lord Jesus together. Singing psalms and hymns, we we all know that, and spiritual songs, you know, the new choruses that we hear that come out. And on top of that, we're to sing and make a melody in our heart. You know, the, the melody that always stands out for me that I remember my mother singing, my mother's one of these women, you know, that believed everything piece of furniture in the house had to be dusted dusted every single day and everything had to be vacuumed every single day and as a kid I spent many a Saturday on my knees putting down Johnson paste wax on hardwood floors and I remember when we got an electric buffer I didn't have to buff anymore with a towel man that was awesome but she believed in that and as she believed in that and had us doing that. You know, there's a song that she sang a lot. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. I can't remember the rest of it. In all of life's ebb and flow. Let's sing it together. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Sweetest name I know. Y'all 
as my every longing, empty singing as I go. Jesus, he keeps us singing as we go. This morning, I'm going to ask our pastors and deacons and elders who are all working the tables to come forward to and, and to the back uh, for communion. And today, as we wrap up this morning's 40th anniversary, we're going to take of the Lord's table. And uh, what I want you to do is when you come and receive it, I want you to branch out across the room as you come down from upstairs. We're going to make a great big circle around this worship center this morning, singing about Jesus and praising him as we go. And um, so if you're from the two outside uh, wings on either side, you can come to that center aisle to the table and over here the same thing. And uh, as you take it, just go and make a, a circle around. And here in the, in the middle, y'all can come and take and, and spread out across. Now, also in the back, you can also go back. I mean, say three-quarters of the way, halfway back. Just get up and go backwards to the tables, and people will be coming down from upstairs. But we've got tables set up around the worship center this morning for us to come and to partake. Okay? So y'all come on. Reach to all the healing streams. 
You know, the most intimate time that people can spend with one another is when we eat together. You know, know that? You know, as we sit down to the meal, and, you know, in North Africa, I've sat down to meals with uh, Berbers in their homes, and it's when they invite you in. I mean, you've got to take your shoes off to even go in their house. So you're sitting there on the floor and your feet sticking out and all that food, so it's pretty intimate, right? Well, think about this. The Lord has invited us to, our, to his table. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. And when he invites us, he doesn't say that we've got to be perfect. Our perfection's in him. He invites us, you know, stinky feet and all, warts and all, imperfections and all. And that's a pretty great thing. And, and we're invited not as guests, but we're invited as family. And this morning, look around the room. And uh, we got a couple of folks still up there in the sound booth uh, that that are the unsung heroes. Thank you, guys. Did y'all get served communion up there, too? Okay. We're family. This is God's family right here. Isn't that amazing? Okay. So the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body that's broken for you. And, And he did the same thing with the cup. He took it. And he said, this is my blood which is shed for you. And the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of our sin. And the Bible says he blessed them. I'm going to ask you to pray with me right now as I pray a blessing over these elements. Father, we bow before you this morning and we thank you for being able to share at your table as family, as your children, as a church. Lord, we thank you for the past 40 years that we've lived together. And Lord, we look forward to the next 40 and eventually to eternity. And Father, now we ask you to take this bread and take this cup and bless it. Use it for our spiritual nourishment to remind us that we stand and bond with the Lord Jesus Christ and united with one another. To you be the glory both now and in your church and throughout all of eternity. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take and eat. And take and drink. Before we close out this morning, what an awesome, awesome day this is. I'm, Wade, come and make your way through the crowd, man. This is uh, Z. Wade Smith. He's our new student pastor here at Village. Woo! Yeah. And um, don't hold it against him, but he's a diehard Arkansas guy. Okay. Some of you have already figured that out. One of our students, I saw it posted on Facebook, Naomi showed up at youth the other night and had on her Arkansas sweatshirt. So already making favorites and all that kind of stuff. (laughs) But, you know, they say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. And so, you know, the process of finding Wade was done with a different idea and I don't believe we've ever done this before either. But I, I just felt like the Lord was impressing upon my heart that we need to commission Wade, so to speak, pray for Wade as he begins this new era of student ministry here at Village. And so I'm going to ask our elders and, uh, and all to come here first. And then our deacon body, y'all come, let's gather around and let's lay hands on Wade. Maybe the last chance to get your hands on him for a while. And, uh, and we're going to pray for Wade um, as uh, we prepare to go forward. And then we're going to close out this morning's worship with a great hymn of, um, O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope in times to come. And he is our hope in the times to come. And we are excited about this. And we praise God for what, for what he's going to do. You want to make a speech or anything? Okay, guys, let's lay hands on him. Okay, all around the room, y'all put a hand on the shoulder beside you. And uh, whoever's near to here, y'all put a hand on these deacons. And now we're a church joined together, praying together for Wade. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Wade. We thank you that you stirred in his heart and that you stirred in our hearts to bring us together in family relationship here at Village. And Father, Wade leaves a a deep and expanded family in Arkansas. 
Lord, close with uh, his immediate family, his blood family, and, and close, Lord, with so many student families that he's impacted over these last 12 years. Father, I ask you to watch over Wade. I ask you to keep him in love with Jesus. I ask you to keep him protected with a hedge of uh, a hedge surrounded him. And Father, I ask you to give him not only peace, but I ask you to give him prosperity in ministry right here at Village. Lord, I ask you to guide him as he raises up a generation of next level uh, leaders. And Father, I ask you to keep him empowered with your Holy Spirit. And Father, I pray for our church family as we're all touching one another, that we would remain faithful to you, focused on you, and honoring you in all of our thoughts and lives. Thank you for Wade once again. And Lord, help us to want to, to know one another and to love one another. In Jesus' name, amen.